revaluation of all values, the principle of abundance. Anyone inquiring into the general premises of relief in the age of its technological intensification would do well to consult the early French socialists, specifically Saint-Simon and his school, whose publications, their journal was not named Le Globe for nothing, are the starting point for an explicit politics of pampering from a genre-theoretical perspective. In the formula of the era of relief, still valid to this day in theory and practice, originates with Saint-Simonism. It states that with the rage with the rise of major industries in the 18th century, the time has come to end the quote-unquote exploitation of man by man and to replace it with man's methodical exploitation of the earth. In the present context, we can acknowledge the statement's epochal significance. The human race, represented by its avant-garde, the industrial class, is thereby identified as the beneficiary of a comprehensive relief movement, or in the terminology of the time, as the subject of an emancipation. Its goal was expressed in the secular evangelical gospel of the resurrection of the flesh during one's lifetime. Such a thing was only conceivable provided that the typical distribution of weight in agro-imperial class societies agro-imperial class societies, namely the relief and release of the ruling few through the exploitation of the serving many, could be revised thanks to the relief of all classes through a new universal servant, the earth of resources, taken over using large-scale technology. What the saint Simonian keyword exploitation means in process-illogical terms, could only be articulated once the philosophical anthropology of the 20th century had developed a sufficiently abstract concept of relief, particularly in the wake of Arnold Galen's efforts. When the cultural sciences were able to employ this concept, it became possible to formulate general statements about the evolutionary direction of advanced technological social complexes that are substantially more practical in systemic and psychological terms than the palpably naive 19th century theses on emancipation and progress. If we trace back both the phenomenon and the concept of relief back to saint Simonian exploitation, it becomes evident that the effect in question, relief via technology, cannot be achieved for the majority without a shift of exploitation to a new bottom. Against this background, it can be argued that all narratives about changes in the human condition are narratives about the changing exploitation of energy sources, or descriptions of metabolic regimes. This claim is not only an entire dimension more universal than Marx and Engels' dogma that all history is the history of class struggles, it also reflects the empirical results far more accurately. Its generality extends further because it encompasses both natural and human energies, quote-unquote labour power. It is closer to the facts because it rejects the bad historicism of the doctrine that all states of human culture are connected in a single evolutionary sequence of conflicts. Furthermore, it does not distort the existing data, despite its high level of abstraction. Such a distortion can be found in the polymogenic didacticism of the Communist Manifesto, which passed over the comparably rare phenomenon of open class struggles, at the risk of ascribing a significance to the slave and peasant result, revolts of earlier history, along with their desperate, undirected and often vandalistic tendencies, that was supposed to be exemplary for the struggles of wage earners to achieve redistribution. The story of the exploitation of energy sources reaches its current hotspot as soon as it approaches the complex event known in both older and newer social history as the quote-unquote industrial revolution, a misnomer we now know, as this too was by no means a quote-unquote radical change in which above and below switch positions. Rather, it heralded the manufacture of products using mechanical substitutes for human movements. The key to the transition from human labour to machine labour, 
and to new human-machine cooperations, lies in the coupling of power systems with executive systems. Such couplings had usually remained latent in the age of physical labour, insofar as the worker, him or herself, as a biological energy converter, embodied the unity of the power system and the executive system. However, once crucial innovations were implemented in mechanical power systems, these couplings were able to be explicitly elaborated. Thus begins the epic of motors. With their construction, a new generation of heroic agents stepped onto the stage of civilization, a generation whose appearance radically changed the energetic rules of the game for conventional cultures. Since the advent of motors, even physical and philosophical principles, such as force, energy, expression, action and freedom, have taken on radically new meanings. Although these forces are normally tamed ones, bourgeois mythology has never completely lost sight of their unbound, potentially disastrous side, describing it in terms of the pre-Olympian race of violent titanic deities. Hence the profound fascination with exploding machines, and indeed with explosions in general. Ever since neo-titans appeared in the midst of modern life, nations have changed into immigration countries for machinery. In a sense, a motor is a headless energy subject that was created because we are interested in using its power. However, it only possesses the impulsive attributes of the agent, Teta, and it is not burdened by reflection. As a beheaded subject, the motor does not move from theory to practice, but from standstill to operation. In motors, that which disinhibits human subjects who are about to take action is triggered by the starting mechanism. Motors are perfect slaves, since we need not worry about complications such as concerns with human rights if we make them work around the clock. They do not listen to abolitionist preachers who have a dream. The dream of a not-too-distant day when motors and their owners have the same rights and the children of humans and machines play with one another. To integrate motors systematically as cultural agents requires fuels of a very different nature than the food that sustained human manual labourers and beasts of burden in the agro-imperial world. This is why the most dramatic sections in the Epic of Motors are the cantos on energy. We could even ask whether the formulation of the abstract homogeneous energy principle, energy song's phrase, is uh, by modern physics is not merely the scientific reflex of the principle of motorization, whereby the vague coupling of nutrition and organism was replaced by the precise relation between fuel and machinery. In the grand narrative of the procedures and stages of energy source exploitation, the transfer of power from the organism opens what could very well turn out to be a permanent final chapter. As we know, modernity's grand narrative of relief begins with an account of the massive invasion by the first generation of mechanical slaves, from which the 18th century onwards came into use as quote-unquote steam engines in the burgeoning industrial landscapes of northwestern Europe. Mythological associations were readily apparent in regard to these new agents as their operating principle. The expansion pressure of trapped steam immediately recalls the titans of Greek theogony, who were condemned to subterranean bondage. Since steam is initially caused by the combustion of coal, it was only with 20th century thermonuclear power plants that a completely new agent was introduced, Thus, fossil fuel had to become the nascent industrial age's heroic bearer of energy. It was one of the numerous dialectics of modernity that coal, a powerful pampering agent, usually had to be extracted through the inferno-like labours of underground mining. Thus, the miners of the coal-hungry 19th and early 20th centuries could be presented as living proof of the Marxist thesis that the wage-labour contract was merely the legal mask of a new slavery. From the later 19th century on, 
petroleum and natural gases, also relieving and pampering agents of the highest order, joined Promethean coal as additional fossil carriers of energy. Their extraction required overcoming obstacles to development that were different than those encountered in underground mining. Occasionally the process of acquiring them exhibited what could be called a natural accommodation, as if nature itself wished to make a contribution of its own to ending the agriculturally defined age of scarcity and its reflection in ontologies of lack and varieties of misery. The primal scene for this accommodation of human demand by natural resources took place in 1859 in Pennsylvania, when the first oil well was discovered near Titusville, and with it the New World's first great oil field in a very shallow layer hardly more than 20 metres below ground. The image of the eruptive oil well, known among experts as a gusher, has since become an archetype of not merely the American dream, but the modern way of life as such, which was made possible by easily accessible energies. The petroleum bath is baptism for contemporary human beings, and Hollywood would not be the central issuing facility of our popular myths had it not shown one of the great heroes of the 20th century, James Dean, bathing in his own oil well as the star of Giant, 1955. The steadily growing influx of energy from fossil stores, which for the moment remains unexhausted, not only enabled constant quote unquote, growth, positive feedbacks between work, science, technology and consumption over more than a quarter of a century, together with implications that we have described as the psycho-semantic modification of populations due to prolonged relieving and pampering effects. It also involved an abrupt change of meaning for such venerable categories of old European ontology as being, reality, and freedom. The concept of the real has now come to include the constructivist connotations that things could always be different, something of which only artists as guardians of the sense of possibility were previously aware. This stands in contrast to the traditional conception of the real, in which references to reality were always infused with the pathos of not possibly being any other way. As a result, the concept demanded submission to the power of finitude, harshness and lack. In the past, a phrase like quote-unquote crop failure, for instance, was loaded with the admonitory severity of the classical doctrine of the real. In its own way, such a phrase reminds us that the ruler of this world can only be death, supported by the four horsemen of the apocalypse, his tried and true entourage. In today's world, what is characterised by the basic experience of surplus energy, the ancient and medieval dogma of resignation, is no longer valid. There are now new degrees of freedom whose effects extend to the level of existential moods, Stimmungen. Small wonder, then, that Catholic theology, which essentially thinks in pre-modern and miserablest terms, has completely forfeited its connection to present-day facts. Even more than Calvinist and Lutheran doctrines, which at least take a semi-modern approach. Accordingly, the concept of freedom also had to shed its conventional connotations over the last hundred years. It sounds new dimensions of meaning on its harmonic series, especially the definition of freedom as the right to unlimited mobility and festive squandering of energy. The two former prerogatives of lords, namely gratuitous freedom of movement and whimsical spending, are thus democratically generalised at the expense of a subservient nature. This is only true, of course, where the climactic conditions of the great greenhouse are already in force. Because modernity as a whole only takes shape against the background whose primary hue is abundance, its denizens are struck by the constant dissolutions of boundaries. They can and must acknowledge that their lives now occur in a time without normality. They pay for their thrownness into the world of excess by feeling that the horizon is drifting.
the sore point in the reprogramming of existential moods in modernity thus concerns the experience of de-scarcification, encountered early on by the inhabitants of the Crystal Palace, something that they have hardly ever acknowledged sufficiently. The sense of reality among people in the agro-imperial age was attuned to the scarcity of goods and resources, because it was based on the experience that their labour, embodied in onerous farming, was just enough to establish precarious islands of human artificiality in nature. This was already addressed in the ancient theories of ages, which bear resigned witness to the fact that even great empires crumble and most arrogant towers are levelled by inexorable nature within a few generations. Agrarian conservatism expressed its ecological moral conclusions with a categorical ban on wastefulness, because the product of labour could not usually be increased, only augmented by looting. At best, people in the ancient world were always clearly aware that what they value, that which they generated, was a limited relatively constant factor that had to be protected at all costs. Under these conditions, the squanderer must have been considered insane. Hence, the narcissistic profligacies of noble lords could only be considered acts of hubris, and their later reinterpretation as quote-unquote culture could not yet be foreseen. These views ceased to be relevant when, with the breakthrough into the fossil fueled style of culture a little more than two centuries ago, a sinister liberalism appeared on the scene and resolutely began to overturn previous standards. While wastefulness had traditionally been the ultimate sin against subsistence, as it jeopardised the always scarce supply of the resources necessary for survival, The age of fossil energy saw a thoroughgoing change in the meaning of wastefulness. We can now calmly term it our first civic duty. It is not that supplies of goods and energies have become infinite overnight, but the fact that the limits of the possible are constantly deferred further and further, which gives them the quote-unquote meaning of being, a fundamentally altered complexion. Now, Only Stoics still carefully take inventory. Ordinary Epicureans in the great comfortable greenhouse assume that the quote-unquote inventory is something that can be infinitely increased. Within a few generations, the collective willingness to consume more was able to ascend to the level of a systemic premise. Mass frivolity is the psychosemantic agent of consumerism. Its blossoming indicates that recklessness has assumed fundamental importance. The ban on wastefulness has been replaced by a ban on frugality, expressed in perpetual appeals to encourage domestic demand. Modern civilization is based less on, quote, humanity's emergence from its self-incurred unproductiveness, end quote, than on the constant influx of an unearned profusion of energy into the space of entrepreneurship and experience. In a genealogy of the motif of wastefulness, we would have to note how the verdict of tradition on the luxurious, leisurely and superfluous was rooted in theological values. On the conventional monotheistic view, everything superfluous could only be displeasing to God and nature, as if they were also taking inventory. It is remarkable that even the proto-liberal Adam Smith, as willing as he is to sing the praises of luxury-stimulated markets, clings to a markedly negative conception of wastefulness, which is why his treatise on the wealth of nations is pervaded by the refrain that wastefulness is a submission to the quote-unquote passion for present enjoyment. It is a habit of quote-unquote unproductive hands priests, aristocrats and soldiers, who, due to a long entrenched arrogance, subscribe to the belief that they are called upon to waste the riches generated by the productive majority. Marx likewise remains bound to the agro-imperial age's conception of wastefulness when, following in Smith's footsteps, he adheres to the distinction between the working and wasting classes, albeit with the nuance that it is 
capitalists, much more than feudal quote-unquote parasites, who now occupy the role of malign squanderers. At least he agrees with Smith in conceding that new economic methods have brought a surplus product into the world that surpasses the narrow surplus ranges of agrarian times. The author of Capital stylizes his bourgeois as a vulgarized aristocrat whose greed and baseness knows no bounds. This portrait of the capitalist as a pensioner ignores the fact that the capitalist system also introduced the new phenomenon of the quote-unquote working rich, who balance out quote-unquote present enjoyment with the creation of value. Nor does it take into account that in the modern welfare and redistribution state, unproductiveness switches from the tip of society to the base leading to the virtually unprecedented phenomenon of the parasitic poor. While in the agro-imperial world, it could normally be assumed that the impoverished were an exploited, productive class, the paupers of the Crystal Palace, bearing the title of the unemployed, live more or less outside the sphere of value creation, and supporting them is a matter of demanding quote-unquote justice than of a national and human solidarity. Their functionaries, however, cannot refrain from claiming that they are exploited individuals who are lawfully entitled to compensation because of their hardships. So, even if liberals and Marxists alike undertook far-reaching attempts in the 19th century to interpret the phenomenon of industrial society, the event of fossil energetics was not perceived in either system, let alone conceptually thought through. By making dogmatically inflated labour value the most important of all explanations for wealth, the dominant ideologies of the 19th and early 20th centuries remained chronically incapable of understanding that industrially extracted and utilised coal was not a quote-unquote raw material like any other, but rather the first great agent of relief. It was thanks to this universal quote-unquote worker of nature Nature arbeiters, for which alchemists searched in vain for centuries, that the principle of abundance found its way into the greenhouse of civilization. Yet even if the pressure of new evidence compels us to understand fossil energy carriers and the three generations of motors spawned by them, steam engines, combustion engines and electric motors, as the primary agents of relief in modernity, even if we go so far as to welcome in them the genius benignus of a civilization beyond lack and muscular slavery, we cannot ignore the signs that the inevitable shift of exploitation in the fossil energy age has created a new proletariat whose suffering enables the relaxed conditions in the palace of affluence. The main emphasis of current exploitation has shifted to livestock, which is produced and used in massive quantities by industrialised farming. On this subject, statistics are more informative than sentimental arguments. According to the German government's 2003 Animal Welfare Report, among almost 400 million chickens were slaughtered in 2002, along with 31 million turkeys and nearly 14 million ducks. Of large mammals, 44.3 44.3 million pigs, 4.3 million cows, and 2.1 million sheep and goats. Analogous figures can be assumed in most market societies, not forgetting that the national statistics must be augmented by vast quantities of imports. Animal proteins constitute the largest legal drug market. The monstrous scale of the figures exceeds any affective judgment nor do analogies to the martial holocausts of the National Socialists, Bolshevists and the Maoists fully reflect the unfathomable routines in the production and use of animal carcasses. I shall refrain from addressing the moral and metaphysical implications of comparing large-scale cases of human and animal extremism. If we consider that Intensive livestock farming rests on the agrochemically enabled explosive growth of animal feed production. It becomes evident that the flooding of markets with the meat of these animal bioconverters is a consequence of the oil floods unleashed in the 20th century. Quote, 
Ultimately, we live on coal and petroleum, now that these have been transformed into edible products through industrial farming. End quote. Under these conditions, one can predict that in the coming century, an internationalised animal rights movement, already almost fully developed, will emphasise the unbreakable connection between human rights and animal suffering, which will lead to a growing unease among the populations of the great greenhouse. This movement could end up being vanguard of a progressive development that redefines non-urban ways of life. Thus, if we are to name the axis around which the revaluation of all values in our developed, comfortable civilization revolves, the only possible answer is the principle of abundance. Current abundance, which always wants to be experienced within the horizon of reinforcements and dissolutions of boundaries, will undoubtedly remain the decisive hallmark of future conditions, even if the fossil energy cycle comes to an end a hundred years from now, or slightly thereafter. In broad terms, it is already clear which energy sources will enable a post-fossil era, primarily a spectrum of solar technologies and regenerative fuels. At the start of the 21st century, however, the details of the shape this will take are still undecided. We can only be sure that the new system, some simply call it the coming quote-unquote global solar economy, will have to move beyond the compulsions and pathologies of current fossil resource policy. The solar system inevitably poses a revaluation of the revaluation of all values, and as the turn towards current solar energy is putting an end to the frenzied consumption of past solar energy, we could speak of a partial return to the quote-unquote old values. For all, old values were derived from the imperative of managing energy that could be renewed over the yearly cycle, hence their deep connection to the categories of stability, necessity and lack. At the dawn of the second re-evaluation, a civilising weather condition on a worldwide scale will emerge that will quite likely display post-liberal qualities inaugurating a hybrid synthesis of technological avant-gardism and eco-conservative moderation. In terms of political colour symbolism, black-green, which it would be a grave mistake to only interpret as a quote-unquote restoration. The conditions for the ebullient expressionism of wastefulness in current mass culture will increasingly disappear. Insofar as the expectations created by the principle of abundance in the industrial era remain in force, technological research will have to devote itself first and foremost to finding sources for an alternative wastefulness. Future experiences of abundance will inevitably see a shift of emphasis towards immaterial streams, as ecosystemic factors preclude a constant growth in the material domain. There will presumably be a dramatic reduction of material flow, and thus a revitalization of regional economies. Under such conditions, the time will come for the as-yet premature talk of a, quote, global information or knowledge society, end quote, to prove its validity. The decisive abundances will then be perceived primarily in the almost immaterial realm of data streams. They alone will authentically possess the quality of globality. At this point, we can only vaguely predict how post-fossility will remould the present concepts of entrepreneurship and freedom of expression. It seems probable that from the vantage point of future, quote-unquote, soft solar technologies, the romanticism of explosion, or more generally speaking, the psychological, aesthetic and political derivatives of the sudden release of energy, will be judged in retrospect as the expressive world of a mass culturally globalised energy fascism. This is a reflex of the helpless vitalism that springs from the poverty of perspectives in the fossil energy-based world system. Against this background, we understand why the cultural scene in the Crystal Palace betrays a profound disorientation. Beyond the aforementioned convergence of boredom and entertainment, 
The cheerful, mass cultural nihilism of the consumer scene is no less clueless and without future than the high cultural nihilism of affluent private persons who assemble art collections to attain personal significance. For the time being, quote-unquote high and quote-unquote low will follow the maxim après nous le soleil. After the end of the fossil energetic regime, there may de facto be what geopoliticians of the present have referred to as a shift from the Atlantic to the Pacific space. This turn would primarily bring about a change from the rhythm of explosions to that of regenerations. The Pacific style would have to develop the cultural derivatives of transition to the techno-solar energy regime. Whether this will simultaneously fulfil expectations regarding worldwide peace processes, the even distribution of planetary wealth, and the end of global apartheid remains to be seen.